Awesome. Well, thanks for joining today. Obviously an important topic and something that probably resonates with all of us, which is uh, self-care and taking care of ourselves, especially during crisis when uh, we're taking care of everyone else who's taking care of us. So as Rachel mentioned, I'm Andy Campbell. I work with Laz Parking. I'm the head of People and Culture, so all things human resources with Laz. And I have a special passion for the work that we do around self-care through uh, an organization called the Institute for Employee Health. So that's what the branding is you're seeing. So I serve as the head of HR and I also do a lot of work in the public and the community as part of the Institute for Employee Health around this topic, which is just really ultimately about improving the healthcare system in our country by promoting self-care practices within organizations. And it's important work to us at last to elevate humanity through business. And so this is part of that work and I hope Throughout our session, you have a chance to certainly ask me any questions. And for those of you who are watching the recording, uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I, I think this is this is stuff I'll talk about for hours all day, every day instead of HR. So um, with that, why don't we skip to the next slide if you can, Rachel, and get off and running here. And I'll start with a story. There we go. I'll start with a story uh, of why this work is so important to me. Um, back in 2015, I took a trip to Bali. That's me on the left. Um, and I was going for a yoga retreat. And, you know, a few days into the trip, I've got some spotty Wi-Fi. I'm on the other side of the world in a different time zone. And I'm realizing, gosh, you know what? People aren't actually calling me from work um, at my hotel, telling me that they need my help making important decisions. They're not calling the airline, begging me to come back uh, because they need me for this or that. And I kind of had a moment of like, wow, real, almost, um, uh, almost a little mental health uh, disaster where, where I realized I was really married to my work and to my job. And since then, and over the course of the last few years, I've started to really spend a lot of time at LAS and obviously personally through the journey of what is the relationship that people have to their career, to their work, to their job, and how does that impact us on the job? And at LAS, we've started to implement quite a few um, tools, resources, programs, and all kinds of things that um, are helping to support our employees with this idea of uh, improving the relationship that people have uh, with their career and their jobs so that they can overall improve their well-being. And ultimately, as a company, certainly it supports our healthcare claims, and our, there's certainly an ROI for that, but more importantly, it's a people-first mindset. So going to the next slide here, I thought, well, you know what, I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm speaking about it. I'm talking about it. Um, I've done a ton of work personally uh, to improve my, my own experience. Um, along the way, we've deployed a lot of things at LAS that have been very successful. And honestly, I was, I was thinking, gosh, I'm doing a pretty darn good job. And then if we go to the next slide, I'll give you a picture of what it looked like when COVID happened. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, about, you know, 6,000 furloughs in, and um, I, I would say um, probably 15 policies in and, and all kinds of things that people needed, and maybe some of you are experiencing this as well during crisis, which is like everyone needing us. And this is a real photo of me during a conference call. If you hit the slide one more time, you'll see the arrow pointing to my Air, AirPods, so you can uh, see that I was actually literally on a... Um, on a conference call with a, with a pack on my head uh, and I'm realizing, wow, maybe I wasn't doing as well of a job as I thought. Um, and, and really my body was starting to break down. And so if you go to the next slide, it kind of hit me that, you know, during this crisis is not really any different than any other time. Like that moment for me laying on the couch with my head in an ice pack was a real critical time for me to self-reflect and to do the work that I teach other people to do so often. You know, obviously the work right now, it looks different. It feels different. There's a different sense of urgency. But what I have really started to realize is, you know, people need leadership and they need leaders in crisis, certainly. But people need leaders when we're not in crisis. In general, just people need leaders. Um, and they need us to be in leadership roles. And so whether I'm furloughing people because of a crisis or I'm just being available because there's some other something going wrong, it's still leadership. And as a result of that, you know, there's a real, um, it's a really important opportunity for us to remember that uh, crisis or not, leadership is still leadership. And, and how we show up and the work we're doing in the sense of urgency may feel different right now. Uh, but at the end of the day, self-care still matters uh, in order for us to be able to provide for others 
um, the best possible leadership that we can, we still have to take care of ourselves. So if we want to go to the next slide, I kind of had a moment of, of realization at that time um, where I started to really ask myself, you know, well, ultimately this is really up to me. You know, I need to make these changes. Um, and so, you know, what does self-care really look like for me, whether I'm in crisis or not? And how can I get more of that back? Um, I need to restore balance so that I don't end up being in the situation I was in, again, um, where my body's starting to really uh, break down and ultimately staying healthy has to be my number one priority because I can't provide leadership to people in crisis or not if I'm not taking good care of myself. So I'll pause here and just say, does this resonate for you guys? You can use the chat and tell me yes or no, but maybe some of you guys are having these similar experiences where you're like, wow, what the heck is going on? I'm all over the place. Um, so any, thanks Rita. I got an absolutely there from Rita. So, you know, I, I think in general, the opportunity here for all of us in terms of our well-being is to remember that crisis or not, leadership is leadership. People need us regardless. And our urgency might change and our needs might change and the type of work we're doing could look different. And it certainly does for me. And I imagine for many of you, it does too. But at the end of the day, I absolutely can tell you and assure you that you know, taking care of yourself still has to maintain a number one, a number one priority. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you won't be able to help others. So if we want to go to the next slide, thanks, Rachel. We, I can ask, you know, well, what have I let out of control? Like, that's the first question I asked myself when I started to realize, like, things had gotten bad. Um, I, I said, well, you know, what have I let get out of control? And... Um, you know, so I'll pause here. I know Rachel's going to move the slide for me. Um, there it is. Okay, thanks, Rachel. So I, I asked myself this question. And before I share my answer, I'll give you a moment to pause and reflect on your own. Um, I, I'd wonder what question, what comes up for you. And feel free to, to share it on the chat if you want to. Um, but, you know, I think what, it, what have you let get, get out of control is a really, really important question to ask yourself. Because you're the only one that can make these changes. You're the only one that can make it better. So if we go to the next slide, um, I will share with you what I let out, get out of control and I suspect it resonates for some of you. Um, and Moira, I love what you have here about um, working remotely until the end of July. That's tough and being alone at home is really hard. So good, uh, good reflection there. So on the left-hand side, what you're seeing on the screen is um, how I usually keep my boundaries in life. Uh, so my boundaries in life are always organized um, and I keep them and I teach them and I enforce them and I believe that they're neat and tidy and if you go hit the arrow one more time you'll see how my boundaries um, have shown up during crisis. Uh, I know <laughs> There we go. Yeah, thanks. So this is my tangled uh, set of boundaries during crisis. So when I started asking myself during that moment of like weakness, when I'm laying there on a conference call with the ice pack on my head, like what is out of control? This is what my boundaries felt like completely out of control, like tangled. I didn't even know which, which way was up. And I knew for me that that was the first place that I needed to start. And as it relates specifically to self-care in general, I always, whether we're in crisis or not, I always start with boundaries because the reality is we can't make more time for ourselves. There will never be more time. You have a finite amount of time. And so you also can't control what comes at you, what people ask you for, what your boss wants, what your clients need. Like none of that's changing. And in fact, no matter how much you try to influence it, you know, I always ask people, well, what, what do you think you can control? I mean, the reality is, you know, not really much of anything except for how we react and how we behave. You can't even control how you feel. Some people like to say they're children, but I'd argue you cannot control your children. <laughs> I'm getting some no's there for sure. You could influence them, but there's definitely, unless you put them in the closet, which is definitely illegal, you cannot control them, right? So, I mean, we really can't control anything except for how we show up in the world and what we do about um, what happens. And so whenever it comes to self-care, our primary foundational principle is boundary setting. So next slide, if we can go there, I feel bad. I'm bossing you around here. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, the, the first question I asked myself is, well, do I even deserve to have boundaries during crisis? I mean, I just went through the process of, you know, furloughing 
7,000 people at last parking. And some of these people don't have jobs and they don't have income and they can't pay their rent and they can't buy groceries for their family. And people are losing their husbands and their wives and their parents and their grandchildren are sick. And I mean, there's so much going on in the world. Do I even really deserve this? Why, why are my boundaries so important? And I think that's an important question to ask because you know, that's a lot of the reason why a lot of us are frantic is our own sense of guilt and shame that we're not affected um, in the way that others are. And so the result of that is we don't feel like we're worthy of the things that we might have been worthy for or, you know, perceived worthiness before the crisis occurred. And why do my boundaries even matter right now? So if we go to the next slide, I kind of went back to the idea of like, I can't be this for people, and you can just advance one more, if I, you know, I'm in the condition that I was in before, ice pack on my head. Uh, you know, the reality is they say it on airplanes, although many of us haven't flown in a while, which I'm grateful for. I've had a nice reprieve from being on the road. <laughs> but like, I can't be this for people if I don't put my own oxygen mask on first. And so at the end of the day, boundaries is an absolute necessity. Now, in crisis, do I need to work differently? Sure. Am I going to get calls at 10 p.m. from our CEO, amazing, the amazing allies, asking me for things for sure. And sometimes am I going to have to answer those? Absolutely, but not always. And what boundaries do I need to set? And what maybe those look different than they used to, but they still have to exist because I literally cannot continue to serve how I need to serve if I'm, I'm showing up in this way. So um, with that in mind, if we just go to the next slide, I'll share a little bit about some basics on boundaries. And, you know, Ultimately, it comes to, it starts with the idea of like, I have a belief that I deserve them. So that's what you see all the way on the left. Like I deserve to have boundaries and I believe that they're acceptable. I believe that they're helpful. I believe that people need them and I believe that we can't survive without them. And you have to be rooted in that core belief. You have to be able to look yourself in the eye and say, I believe in myself enough. I believe in this process enough that I know I can't be to others what I need to be if I don't take this seriously. And so ultimately the basics on boundaries is your belief comes first. And then once you do believe that, then it's much more easy to give yourself, the next slide would be um, permission. So um, ultimately it starts with, I believe I deserve it. And then, you know, I get to give myself permission to have them, to set them, to enforce them, um, which by the way, setting boundaries and enforcing boundaries are two different things. So we got to set them and we have to enforce them. So when I believe in them, I give myself permission to have them. And then um, I set them and I enforce them. And I think that's critical. Now, what is a boundary for me could look different for, for you. Yours might be, uh, Carmen said, meetings, um, something that uh, is a lot for her maybe showing up. I don't know about you guys. I'm in meetings all day, every day, um, about meetings about meetings nowadays and meetings about the last meeting we had. And then we're going to talk about the next meeting and the last meeting. And we're having meetings about everything. That's a great example. There might be something else for you. For me, my boundary has been flexibility. So I, I've realized that I can't expect that right now I'm going to work from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's just probably not realistic. Um, and work looks different. I'm not at home alone. You might hopefully won't hear my dog bark, but it's possible. I mean, there's a lot of things going on for all of us in these times. And so my boundaries have been, you know, certain evenings in the week or certain types of circumstances that I've had to set time away for, or I've said, you know what, I know I'm not going to be able to control the rest of my day. So every morning I'm going to get up and not get online until X or not look at my phone or whatever that is for you. So it, it might look different for all of us. Um, but knowing what you need to do in order to keep yourself um, honest is what's critical as it relates to this. So let's go one more slide and I'll leave the boundary conversation with technology. Uh, I purposely made the screen look very busy because that's what technology is for us. It's noise. It's so noisy. So the issue is when we go into crisis mode, our adrenaline is flooding or, you know, flooding our body. Our adrenaline is high. Our cortisol levels are high because of stress. And so we're soaring through the roof. And then when we do have downtime, or, or set downtime for ourselves by setting a boundary. It's very hard to disconnect because our adrenaline levels have been so high for so long. And so the result is we go straight from work, 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 crazy, crazy to technology, look at what's happening on social media, read the news. <laughs> I'm not sure if this resonates for you guys, but for me, this has been um, the pattern. And so what was happening for me when I go back to the moment of ice pack on my head was I wasn't taking any quiet time. 
I went straight from crazy amounts of time spent at work and somebody even I think already made a comment about this in the chat with the idea that we have um, technology at us, digital stuff coming at us all day long. And then you're reading what people are saying and then you're reading the comments and you're looking at the news and there's all these things that are happening and it's just so overwhelming for our bodies and that's just probably not serving in the long run. So technology may be a boundary you need to set, maybe not. Um, but I'll, I'll start with that as a suggestion and an action item, which is, you know, how, how many of you are sleeping next to your phone? Is your phone next to your bed? Um, and if it is, <laughs> thank you for being honest. If it is, you got to get rid of it. You know, how can you create some separation from the technology? Like, and, and, and I always tell people, like, if I can figure out a way to do it, I know I'm imagining other people in the parking industry can, you know, we're not necessarily saving lives, although we like definitely um, are, are it lads particularly a people first company and believe in the work we do. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I know that I'm not serving myself by not sleeping. I'm not going to serve others by not sleeping. And that technology is a real issue. So I leave my phone downstairs when I come up to go to sleep. That's a really excellent um, a suggestion. Hopefully, uh, hopefully some of you might, might take that one. I like what Rachel has in here, turning off the alerts. Yes, absolutely. So I definitely have no alerts on my phone. Like I can promise you there's email in your inbox. You don't need it to alert you to tell you there's email in your inbox. I can assure you there's probably email in your inbox. So I keep my alerts to text messages and phone calls only because that's a way that you can uh, keep the number of notifications you're getting to a minimum. So that's definitely um, a solution. And I'm glad some of you saw my other talk at the Leadership Summit, set that into place already, which is good. So, so leaving your phone in another room, downstairs, not looking at it, give yourself a little space between the time that you end technology and the time that you go to sleep and then doing the same in the morning, easing into the day before you go immediately into your email or immediately into the news. Um, and, and using your silent modes, your do not disturbs, your airplane mode, whatever you can do. Uh, and there's ways people will say to me all the time, well, what if I have an emergency with so-and-so or my father is sick or whatever? And what I say is like, there is a way to make a do not disturb actually ring, you know, through if you have somebody in your favorites. So there are ways around that for emergencies. And so definitely a, um, a solution for you if it works. So that, you know, less, less time, maybe not watching the late night news, maybe watch the 6 p.m. news and not watching the news at 10 p.m., uh, you know, making your decision, maybe limiting the amount of time you are watching what's going on in the world. Like I, I definitely feel very anxious when I'm reading the news and finding out what's going on and particularly in our political environment. Um, it's caused, I think, a lot for a lot of people. It creates a lot of, despite what side you're on, uh, there's a lot of, in, you know, conflict. And if you're empathic like I am, and you can really feel what's going on in the world, which many of you might also uh, feel that feeling of energy in the world right now, the idea of that conflict can create a lot of anxiety. So technology and removing ourselves from, from the news is, is really, really important. Um, so if we want to go to the next slide, I'll just say that, you know, being in a state of mindful versus mindful is ultimately what we're trying to solve for. Like, Mindful, which you would see on the left, like my mind is literally full and mind being mindful or present, which is this one in the middle is ultimately um, the, the direction we want to move. And your mindful might not look like mine. I mean, I, I do enjoy practicing yoga and having some quiet time. Sometimes it's a walk in nature. Sometimes it's just reading a book. Sometimes it's just being quiet for a minute, like whatever that is. It doesn't need to be on a yoga mat and, you know, with your hands in some sort of some sort of mudra being fancy in lotus position. Like by any means, that doesn't need to be that. But what is mindful look? Is it a breath, a very conscious breath in between each conference call? That's an example of mindful. Is it taking a moment and saying, wow, how do I feel? Scan my body right now, just for, for 30 seconds. How do I feel today? Is it waking up and saying, how do I feel today? What do I need for my body? How, do, how can I feel whole? That's how we get to this idea of whole living and feeling present, feeling connected, you know, really feeling content, um, even in the state of crisis, you can still be a responder to crisis as a leader and also be content and that's okay. And I think you have to give ourselves permission for that, um, which is really important. So let's go to the next slide and I'll share some examples of um, ways that you can build in potentially some uh, best practices, and maybe you're already doing some of these, and maybe you have some others, which I would invite you to share in the chat. I like uh, Rita's 
comment here, consciously do not watch the news at night and on the weekends. That's awesome. <laughs> I love hearing that. That's, that's really fabulous. I also consciously don't watch the news either. I just get a quick scan of CNN twice a day and then I'm good. That's all I really need to know. I mean, reality is it's happening whether I know about it or not. So, um, so starting with the left uh, side, I'll suggest, and this may or may, all of these may or may not work for you. So you need to pick from these ideas what works best for you and resonates. You know, taking two to three times um, a week for a finite end to your workday is important. It's a little harder I think in some roles than others, but for me, I know like I cannot work until 10 p.m. every night. That's not serving me, um, but maybe it's a finite start time then. So I can't do 12 or 14 hour, 15 hour days every day, but maybe I know I can't control my afternoon. And so I'm not going to get online until 10. I had a really um, interesting conversation with a therapist recently during this crisis. And what she said was so powerful to me. She said, we have to be flexible because these aren't normal times. So why are we trying to have normal work days in a time that like we aren't normal? Um, you know, stopping and having a break in the middle of the day, um, which I think Moira just shared, or starting later or having a finite end is really critical. So being flexible with ourselves and recognizing that this is a different type of time. And so Christ, our crisis and our, um, our life in crisis looks different and that's okay. So giving yourself the grace to be flexible is really important. Like Bridget's suggestion here, going for a walk during a phone meeting. I have some particular phone meetings, which I find to be most stressful or most, we'll use the word annoying, because <laughs> I imagine you guys all have one of those too. And so I, uh, I definitely um, choose those meetings as the ones that I will generally walk for. So I have something else to um, think about. Now, I, I love this, this third one around connecting to your purpose. So people who are most content, content are really clear and able to articulate what their life's purpose is. So while I work at LAS and I'm the head of HR, I definitely would argue that my life's purpose is not being in HR. That is definitely not my life's purpose. <laughs> um, and so I, I, but I can really clearly articulate what is, my, what is my soul's purpose here? Like, what am I here to do in this world? And am I connected to that through my job? It might not be the job exactly, but for me, I know that my life's purpose is improving our healthcare system in this country by getting people to take seriously that they get to control their own well-being. That is my purpose, at least for now. And so how do I do that? I build programs and help the community to do that. That doesn't have anything to do with my job at labs. It's certainly helping my job. But every day I say to myself, how am I going to connect to my purpose? Even in you know, how do I integrate that into my work? How do I integrate that into my life? And so being really clear on your purpose, there's a ton of research about being people who are really clear on what their purpose is, is a way in which they can demonstrate being really content, calm, peace, balanced, whatever words you want to use. We talked about the phones in the bedroom, so I'll leave that one alone for now. We talked about social media and the news. The last one I'll say is move your body um, for this slide. And um, I think it's important to go back to the idea of grace and flexibility, self-compassion, like body movement looks different for everybody. And for you, it might be a walk and for your friend, it might be a run and for your other friend or family member, they could be a person who goes to the gym and lifts weights and is super fit and all of that's okay. What does your body need? And our bodies do need to move, but that looks different for everyone and that's okay. So there's a lot of noise about like, what exercise should look like, or I should exercise. And the result of that is we don't end up doing it because we feel ashamed that we're not doing what we should in the first place. And so the question is, what do you need? And allow yourself to have that. And I think that's really important. Like there was a time in my life that I was doing a hot power yoga class or, you know, a session at the gym with a trainer three times a week. Like Today's my birthday, by the way, and I'm 42. And I'll tell you that at 42, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff anymore because my body doesn't feel like it did when I was 25 or 30. So um, I, I think it's a, an important moment of recognition to know, like, well, thank you for the happy birthdays. I wasn't doing that for the acknowledgement, but it's nice. We only get one birthday a year. So um, thank you guys. But I, you know, I think it's really important to uh, recognize that your body might need something different than what it did before or what it will later or what your neighbor needs, your friend needs, your family member needs, your spouse needs, et cetera. So Rachel, I like what you have finding, having your rules or guidelines, like, okay, I need food, I need sunshine, I need sleep, 
I need movement, whatever that is. So everybody's got their thing that they need. So really good comments, you guys, great. All right, so um, if we wanna to go to the next slide, I have a few more for you. And um, Moira, I love your comment about making your space comfy. That was also a really good tip. A few others for you, learn something new. There's a lot of interesting, um, uh, a lot of very interesting um, things out there, especially during crisis that are out there for free, you know, free cooking classes, Nikon's offering free photo classes through Instagram TV. Like, is this the time that you can use in crisis to learn something new that you've always wanted to learn? And having access to a lot of stuff online now um, might be an opportunity. One of my favorite things to do is watch the world go by. Yeah, TED Talk's great, Moira, um, and LinkedIn classes. So watching the world go by is big. Um, I'm a real fan and advocate of watching the world go by, and I like to combine that with the next one, which is this five senses exercise. So what that exercise is, is a mindful exercise of getting present where you'll, you would um, maybe sit out on your porch or sit in the yard or sit in your desk, wherever it is, and you, you literally say to yourself, you can do it out loud, but I like to do it in my own head so I don't look like the crazy person talking to myself in the neighborhood. And I'll do things like, okay, I see that tree, I see that blue car, I see that mailbox. So it's a way for me to be in the moment. And then what do I hear? I hear the bird chirping, I hear the sound of the garbage truck, you know, whatever that is. And you do that five, five things I hear, five things I see, five things I smell. And it's a nice way for you to stay away from your phone, even if it's only for, you do one round or you do it for five minutes or whatever, step, you know, step outside, step into a different room, look outside your window and, and try that exercise. And it's a practice of getting grounded. Uh, next one, snail mail. I'm not sure if, oh, let's go back there. We got a little out of control. That's right, you're getting a little crazy with it. There we go. Okay, <laughs> so snail mail is another one of my faves. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can still send mail through the mail. And if you haven't done this in a while, um, I have it here. They actually still have stamps you can purchase. They're 55 cents now, so they're really expensive these days, but you can still buy them. And I have, I can even move my camera to see my shelf here. My second shelf over there is full of all these blank cards. Thank you cards, greeting cards, hello cards. And so I have a practice of at least twice a week, I sit down and I write somebody a letter uh, in a card. And it's, thank you, hello, I miss you hope you're well, whatever it is I have to say. And I do that at least uh, twice a week. And I literally write it, close it, stamp it. And then I walk to the mailbox and I put the little red flag up and the mailman comes and he gets it like he used to in the old days before we had, we, before when we actually did have to use that. So, um, and actually the first time I did it during COVID, I did check to see if the mail actually went after the fact. So I wasn't like fully trusting the process. <laughs> but after that, I feel like uh, the process really works. So strongly suggest they, it feels so good to send somebody something and I know it feels so good to read what, what kind of stuff do we receive in the mail these days like nothing you know that is worth looking at so when you get a letter from somebody it's so beautiful to open it up so you can do that the way it makes people feel yeah Rita exactly build the way it makes people um feel can be a really awesome thing for your own self-care so the last two, breathe and speak up. I already talked about breathing, um, but just a little tip on that. You don't have to be in a lotus position in meditation to breathe. You can just take a deep breath in between every meeting. You can take a deep breath in between every, every time you have something going on that's stressing you out. You can take a deep breath and a pause when you're feeling frustrated. There's times that you can breathe and just getting conscious about your breath is a way to calm your nervous system down and to practice self-care, even if it isn't for like extended periods of time. And then speaking up is a really important self-care quality. If, if you find that you're not being heard or feeling like you're not being heard or potentially feel like you're on a mute button when you're not <laughs> in a room full of people, which often happens to me because I work with a lot of very passionate people, we'll say passionate people um, around me, I don't always have a voice and I sometimes have to really recognize that I'm not being heard and I have to use words like, I'm feeling like I'm not being heard. And I, I can be direct about it. And I think it's an opportunity for all of us to recognize like when we're not feeling heard, it stifles us. And the result of that is it compromises our care for ourselves. And so if you're in, a, in that type of situation, you know, check in with yourself. Why am, I, why am I not feeling heard? Why am I not speaking up? What am I afraid of? Why am I, not a, why am I afraid to speak up? 
Um, so there's a lot of questions you could ask yourself and, and dig into either with an HR person or with your with a coach, or you could certainly reach out to me. I'll talk about that stuff for hours. Um, so feel free to do that. All right, let's go to um, the next slide and I'll wrap up with a few more just specific resources. So what I've shared so far have just been some um, ideas for you, but if you want to bring them all up here, I can go through them all. Um, Rachel, then you don't have to click along. So the first one, uh, the class by Taryn Toomey, if you want to write down an idea, that's a fabulous, thank you, that's perfect. That's a fabulous um, resource. I don't know if anybody's tried that, but if you haven't, it's this awesome, she's an awesome um, instructor who has an, a digital studio with some interesting movement ideas. Um, I have a lot of, of recommendations of books to read around this concept on the bookshelf on the website for the Institute for Employee Health. So if you are, a lot of people are always asking, well, how can I do a little research on this? Or, well, you know, where should I start? Uh, that's a great place to start. Tons of, of good resources there specific around um, uh, self-care and this concept of self-care from the inside, psychological self-care, I'm going to call it, not necessarily diet. You're not going to find any diet and exercise books on that site, to be clear. Uh, this is all about psychological self-care. And obviously coaching um, is a resource through the Institute as well. Uh, definitely options for lots of apps on meditation, yoga. I mean, especially these days, there's so many things online because a lot of places have had to move online. Um, so tons, tons of resources there, free photo classes and cooking classes and all kinds of things. Um, and then you already mentioned it, I think it was Bridget or someone else who said, you know, get on, take a walk during a conference call. Um, so I call that walk and phone talk. Uh, you also could just walk and phone talk with a friend uh, as the friend who you usually take walks with. And you can't these days for whatever the reason is. So I'll do a lot of walk and talk with my friends. So I'll pause there, um, just ask that before I, I wrap up, any questions that I can answer about what I've covered so far, or any things you'd like me to get into any more deeply? All right. And while we wait, I don't know if anybody might want to pop in the chat or, or ask a question, but um, a lot of us don't, you know, we have some control over our schedule. I have a friend that talks about clean underwear, right? Oh. Did I do my laundry? Did I eat something good? Did I do the things to control my day, right? But sometimes people above us aren't always as in tune. Can you say a little bit about helping to manage up and set boundaries effectively that way? Because we all need to manage up, down, sideways, right? Yeah, um, yeah it's definitely challenging. And, you know, I can attest to the challenge of it all. So I, I'm in the same type of environment. Obviously, I work I have five bosses, although I report to Al as our CEO, I definitely have a lot of bosses. And I, I, I think it's an interesting for me, and I can make this relevant, is that like, you know, I'm not an owner in our company necessarily, like the guys who own our company are. And so my level of passion is very high, but I don't have, you know, the nonstop 24-7 desire to like right size the ship immediately. I mean, I want to, obviously, but I think um, it's an example of like how this really probably will resonate for a lot of you, what Rachel's question is. So definitely resonates for me. So what I'll say is, and again, I come from a psychological safety perspective as it relates to self-care is when we don't manage up or we don't speak up, it's often out of fear. So the first question I ask myself is like, what am I afraid of here? Like, why am I setting boundaries? But not usually when we set boundaries, the issue isn't setting them. Like, okay, I'm not taking another call at 10 p.m. We can do that all day long. It's enforcing it, right? Okay, when Al calls, do I, do I answer? And so when, I, when that happens for me and I'm finding I'm compromising my boundaries, I'll ask myself, like, what am I afraid of? Like, what am I afraid of here? And what is my worst case scenario? And that's often what happens. If you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you've heard of that, the very base need is our, you know, our food, our shelter, our um, basic needs need to be met. And our job serves a need for for full, I mean, our, our job serves fulfilling our basic needs. We get money to be able to pay for the things that keep us healthy and safe. And so when we don't manage up, we will often um, question ourselves um, for certain about, you know, from a fear-based perspective. So sometimes those fears are real. Like if I, the last time I spoke up, I got yelled at and I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. Right. So like, that's an important fear that we need to unpack. Sometimes it's as simple as like, um, I don't speak up because I don't want anyone to think I'm not on board with this, 
or something. And so usually that's where I start with people is I coach them through, well, what are we afraid of? And then we kind of unpack from there. And for example, if it's something of like, I don't want to speak up because I don't want to feel like I'm not on board. It's, it's usually using a fact feeling outcome based formula. So I'll say things like, like, like fact, the last three times we've talked, you've called me after 8 p.m. That's a fact. And then I'll say something like, I'm feeling worried that I'm not able to disconnect enough to restore my body to be able to provide the best service to our employees. What I'd like to do, and that's the feeling, right? I'm feeling worried. And then I'll go something to outcome. What I'd like to do is see if we can collaborate on a better approach for us connecting more frequently so that I have the chance to restore and so that you get what you need. So it's not a don't call me or I'm not on board. It's a, it's a very vulnerable, but also factual direct approach to solving a problem. And I use that fact feeling outcome often. So that's probably where my default would go. That was a really long answer to get myself there. But I think it's important for everyone to know that like, you know, this is human type of, this is very human, all of this stuff we're talking about and what's going on in the world right now. There's no better time to show you're human. And so I, I feel it's really important to have that kind of dialogue. Like I have had multiple dialogues in the last several weeks when things are getting nuts, where I've literally said, I cannot sustain at this pace. Can we talk about how this can work for you and work for me so that neither of us end up not getting what we need? And sometimes it's just a matter of being honest. Like, and I, I think that's it's really important. Um, okay, I see another question that came in and I will quickly answer it for you, which is, um, let's see, any advice on how to start meditation? Uh, so meditation is such a loaded word. I think it has a, quite, an, quite an intense connotation. So I like to call it quiet time. And so the reason I do is because when you call it quiet time, it doesn't feel so intimidating as a start point. Call it what you want. That's what I call it. So um, what I like to do is I find if, if you've never, ever done it, it's very hard to get out of like, what am I doing for dinner? What's for like all the stuff that goes on when we're getting quiet. So what I like to do is the first thing, hands on body. When you put your hands on your body, you get grounded and it's much easier to stay in the moment. I'll pick a certain amount of time. So insight timer is a good one because it's, uh, you can, you can set your timer for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, hundred minutes, but you can also take guided meditations if you want to. Um, but I also like to find songs that work for me, just songs that make me feel grounded and that I enjoy. And, and I'll put them on my earbuds and I'll sit with my hands on my body. And that is how I started. And now I'm in a practice where I can do it daily without it feeling overwhelming. But it's, you have to just sometimes use the tools to get yourself there. I would definitely suggest small bursts, not feeling like you have to sit a certain way or be a certain way. You can lay down. It doesn't matter. You know, you don't have to sit straight up. Um, when you're starting out, lay down, get comfortable, be comfortable in your body. So not everyone can, I can tell you, I've practiced yoga for 15 years. I cannot sit in a lotus, like my, my, leg, my hips don't cross my legs. It doesn't happen. I always have to kneel and I'm not ashamed of that. I sit on a prop. So fine, you know, sit on a pillow, get comfortable because you won't be able to stay quiet if your body is hurting. Um, so that's another suggestion I would have. And then just hands on body would be, you know, whether it's, hands on your heart or one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly, which I know you can't see my belly or, you know, hands on my, on my head or hand on my forehead, like whatever it needs to be. But if you have your hands on your body, it's a nice way to stay grounded. The last thing I'll say is you can't really see it either, but if you put your hands on your rib cage here, um, that's another way you can feel your breath go in and out, like breathe out, breathe in, and you can feel the breath expand and contract, expand, contract, which is a nice grounding mechanism too. So. Um, I should have probably started by saying I, I, I have, I definitely have, have the experience field teaches. I am a certified yoga instructor, so I'm not just throwing out crap that isn't true. <laughs> to be clear, I should have also told you that I'm a, I have a certification, a health coach certification, and a and a yoga teacher training certification. So I don't want anyone to think I'm just making shit up here. So, anyway, all right. Um, any other questions I can answer before I um, wrap this up with a little story? Looks like we're good. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, when I was in my teens is when I had my first panic attack. And I'm very open about my experiences with anxiety because I think the more we talk about it, the more other people are willing to share their stories and we become much more connected. And this is a really, 
really big thing for people and it can be debilitating in our lives. And so um, some days it's an easy opponent, you know, uh, in, my, in the fight club I'm in with anxiety and some days it's debilitating and I don't want to get out of my bed. And I think there's a lot of people out there who uh, have those experiences too. And when I think about times of crisis like we've been in, how critical it is that we have these honest, open conversations, share our own stories so that other people can feel like it's okay to share their story and bring the humanness back of, of all of this. Because the reality is this experience we've all had with this crisis, this is so human. You know, people are losing their jobs, people can't pay for their mortgages, people are losing their spouses and their friends, and people are getting sick, people are in the hospital and they can't visit their um, friends and family. So there's so many things um, that are happening these days that are so human. And so I'll bring us back to the idea that like, you get to be responsible for what your care looks like. Like you get to do that. And what it says on the screen, you know, when we have the courage to walk into our own story and own it, we get to write the ending. And I would suggest strongly that uh, everybody take ownership of their own care. That's what self-care means. And know that it goes beyond diet and exercise. Know that you, there are resources available in the world to help each other. And know that kindness is really, honestly, the best way that we can connect with each other through this human experience. You know, as a leader, you got to take care of yourself first. You have to put your own oxygen mask on first. So I will end there and say humbly to IPMI, thank you so much for including me in your virtual conference. I appreciate the opportunity to connect with so many people. I invite you to reach out to me. You can find me on the Laz Parking um, website's executive profiles. You can find me on the Institute for Employee Health website, find me on LinkedIn. So I'm, I'm more than happy to offer any guidance, assistance, resources to anyone one-to-one. -one. So thank you very much for including me, Rachel. You are so welcome. Thank you to everybody. I know how crazy and busy it is. Um, and we welcome, you know, the opportunity to share this time with you. Um, this recording will be part of the 2020 IPMI Virtual Parking and Parking and Mobility Virtual Conference and Expo. It's such a mouthful. Um, it will be posted in the community booth. You can share it with your team members. And I did mention in the chat, we will have a short yoga recording available when you need to take a break, 30 minutes or less, and a mobility class. Again, that's under 20 minutes with two of our, our local CrossFit coaches. So again, all trained individuals, um, things you can do over coffee. I encourage you to stay active during those sessions. Um, there's really no need to access it all at once. You have it for the year. So do the live things, connect with the humans. The, point, the humans are the point, right? Connect with the humans, interact with the speakers. Um, and you know, let me know if you have additional questions. Andy, thank you so much. Happy birthday. I hope it's <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you.